Welcome back to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD, where we explore the intersection of health and hypermobility, focusing on dancers and other aesthetic athletes. This is co-host Jennifer Milner, here with the founder of Bendy Bodies, Dr. Linda Bluestein. Our goal is to bring you state-of-the-art medical information to help you live your best life. Please remember to always consult with your own healthcare team before making any changes to your routine. Our guest today is Alyssa Seeley, two-time paratriathlon gold medalist, fresh from her gold medal win in Tokyo. Hi, Alyssa, and welcome to Bendy Bodies. Hi, I'm excited to be here this morning. So Alyssa, before we go any further, can you give us a little background both into your health journey and your competitive career? Yeah, I was diagnosed in 2010 with Chiari 2 malformation, basilar invagination, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome after about two and a half years of seeking a diagnosis and, and being in and out of the hospital. Growing up, I was a very, very, very active kid. Um, I did every single sport my parents could put me into, t-ball, soccer, baseball, um, karate, gymnastics, dance, uh, you name it, I did it. And I just had a ton of energy and loved being active. I finally found my place in competitive dancing and in competitive running. And that is where my career in triathlon stemmed from. And in college, I switched from running to triathlon and I have not looked back. I love the juxtaposition of competitive dancing and competitive, you know, what most people consider a sport instead of dance. I love that you did both of them and I'm sure enjoyed both of them and got something different from each of them. That's very cool. Yeah. I, you know, absolutely believe that every sport, every activity has something to teach you as a person, as a human, and as an athlete. And my strength is the run and triathlon. Um, it has been described as my deadly weapon many times, um, because that's typically where I finish races and put my competitors behind me. Um, but I do credit dance for that. Learning how to use my, uh, feet at a young age. Now my foot, um, has been really helpful in running. Uh, they're very similar, uh, mechanics in the way you use your foot when you're dancing, jumping, um, gliding across the stage and when you're running. And if you know how to use your feet properly, it prevents injury and definitely helps your run form. That is a great connection. And I often hear dancers are encouraged to start running as sort of a cross training conditioning for the aerobic aspect of it. And something that they don't think about very often is that their form for running needs just as much attention as their form for dancing. So I love that you're talking about how you could take the training that you did in dance and add it to the training that you needed for running. So it's not just going out there and seeing how fast you can go, but there's technique to it. There's biomechanics to it. And so you want to apply that same attitude of that towards running as you do towards dancing, or you should, right? For everybody out there trying to do more than one sort of exercise. Absolutely. Which is a great thing to do because we know that that's being more diverse is tends to be better for your body. Well, Alyssa, you are a multiple gold medal athlete, as well as someone with multiple complex medical conditions, including Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and others, as you've already mentioned. How have you been able to compete at such a high level, despite having so many health challenges? Sheer stubbornness and a team that I have built over the years that has supported my dreams and been willing to improvise, to look outside of the box and to come up with solutions when problems arise. That's fabulous. And you mentioned about being diagnosed with Chiari 2 malformation, basilar invagination, and EDS. Um, can you walk us a little bit more through that diagnostic journey and how those conditions impacted you? Yeah. After my diagnoses, I looking back and when doctors started asking questions, I've had symptoms my entire life. I've dislocated joints my entire life. I've um, subluxed joints my entire life. As a kid, it was my like what we called stupid human trick. I would just like pop my joints out and pop them back in and people thought it was disgusting and hilarious all at the same time. <laughs> and it just was what it was. Like I had no idea that that was something that was wrong. Um, 
you know, I was obviously as a dancer, I was always very flexible. I did gymnastics as well. Never had to work for my flexibility. It was super easy. Sometimes being the center of some jealousy because of it when others were working really hard to get their splits. And I was like, okay, this is boring. Let's do something else. As I grew, my symptoms got more severe uh, with time. And I would say, uh, or some of the secondary diagnoses became more evident. Um, We think I probably had gastroparesis my entire life, but it became pretty evident about third grade and continued to get worse throughout high school and into college. Um, But because I was a dancer and a a runner, it was automatically an eating disorder. And it was, you know, there was nothing actually wrong with me. And they decided this with no testing. So in high school, when things started to get really bad, my pot started to get worse. I would pass out standing up. I would you know, shake in practices. I wasn't able to eat enough. I was throwing up. I just hid it from the world. Doctors didn't believe me. And so I wasn't going to tell anybody else about it. I was just going to keep my head down and I was going to do whatever I could to accomplish my dreams. It was finally in college that things got to a breaking point. I was having seizures. There were times when I would stop breathing. And that's when I could no longer hide that something was truly wrong. I was in and out, in and out of the hospital being gaslighted by physicians and told that there was nothing wrong with me. It was all in my head. I was doing it for attention and a whole laundry list of other excuses. At the time I was working for a doctor and she did believe me. She saw it with her own eyes. And one day we sat in her office at the end of the day and she called my neurologist and was like, I'm not getting off the phone with you until something is done. Something is very seriously wrong. This is not psychosomatic. This is not in her head. She's not attention seeking. Something is wrong. And she's like, in any ways, nobody can psychosomatically stop breathing. That is not a thing. Like that does not happen. And he continued to ignore it and do nothing. So I tried to continue on with my life. I was a collegiate athlete. I was a full ride scholarship student in in college. And I was doing the best I could to just make it by. And It was the doctor I worked for. She's the one uh, PA who worked in her office is actually the one who suggested Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And it was actually pretty early in these two and a half years I mentioned earlier. But at the time, I mean, this was 15 years ago, very little was known about it. Very little was known about his comorbidities, that any of this was related or that it was anything more than just like, okay, my joints dislocate. And so Although I had that diagnosis, it wasn't really helpful in getting any help at the time. And so after being in and out of the hospital for years, uh, getting no answers from doctors, I finally was at my wit's end and I pulled all of my medical records from the hospital and started going through them page by page and Googling anything I didn't know, searching answers myself and Unfortunately, I had started at the most recent medical records when I should have started at the beginning. I got all the way back about 7,000 pages and saw on my very first CT scan that the Chiari malformation was there. And the neuroradiologist who read it suggested being referred to neurosurgery immediately. That was never done. It was ignored by the neurologist I was seeing. And he just continued to tell me there was nothing wrong with me and that it was all in my head. So... I did a little Google search just to find somebody who treated Chiari and I called the, there was a neurosurgeon happened to be in the town I was living in at the hospital that I was being seen at. And he was one of the leading experts in the world and he was a pediatric neurosurgeon. I was an adult at this time, so I wasn't sure he was, would take me, but I was hopeful that there would at least be some sort of advice or answers. I called his office And I just asked, you know, Hey, I see, I saw this on my CT scan and there's multiple other MRIs that confirm it. Do you have any suggestions? And the person on the phone is like, hold on a second, let me get you the nurse. And so I speak with the nurse and she's like, what now tell me exactly what your scan says. So I read it, I read it to her, the herniation and everything. She asks about my symptoms, the Uh, seizures, the episodes where I would stop breathing, the passing out, all of that. And she's like, hold on just one moment. She puts me on hold. Me not thinking anything of it because you're put on hold by doctors all the time, right? She goes and gets the neurosurgeon. He answers the phone and he's like, can you send me those reports right now? And I'm like, well, they're in your hospital system. Like you could pull up the images and he's like, oh, perfect. So he pulls them up on the computer and he's like, how soon can you come in? And so I saw the neurosurgeon 
in that day. And within days I was having surgery and so many of my symptoms were relieved shortly after that point. Wow. The journey then continues. Um, at that point, I still didn't have diagnosis of POTS or gastroparesis or MCAS or any of the secondary diagnoses. And those have kind of come over the years, but we, you know, I've had symptoms for years and years and years, and this has been going on most of my life, if not all of my life. And so that's a quick little glimpse into my, my story. <laughs> that is a story that is number one, amazing. And number two has so many elements that we hear over and over again from the people that we work with the whole, um, you've had these symptoms your whole life, but at first may not have been aware of it because it just seemed like a cool thing, right? The cool party trick or whatever it might be. And then as you hit your teenage years and you start to kind of hit that wall, you're such a high level performance athlete that you just end up sort of medically masking it and continuing to move forward. And then you're trying to get help and you're trying to get get information and you feel like you're not being heard and you feel like the doctors don't believe you. We've had other people on who have had gastroparesis that had said the same thing. Well, you were a dancer, you must have an eating disorder. And then to go from that to having to be your own medical detective. I don't know that I've talked to someone else who has gone through every page of their medical records and gone to that depth of discovering your Chiari malformation yourself and getting the physician on the phone <laughs> in one phone call and getting the help that you so desperately needed. But what an incredibly encouraging story for other people to hear just that you have been on this journey and the struggle that you went through um, is one that is mirrored by so many others. And um, it's, it's really impressive what you have done advocating for yourself. And another piece that's really familiar to us is that you had one person that believed in you. You had one medical doctor who said, Hey, I'm not sure about this. I think, I think you're not lying. <laughs> I think there's something going on. And just having that one person that kept you going and helped you and sort of encouraged you and pushed you forward. Um, that's an amazing story. Yeah. I mean, I was desperate. I was being told that on one hand that there was nothing wrong with me. Um, but the day I actually pulled my medical records, I was in that neurologist's office and he walked in, I was 19 years old. I was sitting by myself in this doctor's office and he walks in and he says, with the way your neuro neurologic symptoms are progressing, you'll be make lucky to make it to October. And this was an, this was August. Oh and he just walked, he just walked out of the door and, and that was it. Like that was the end of the appointment. And I just left and I was like, and I didn't even know what to make of it because here this guy is telling me I'm crazy, that there's nothing wrong with me. He had gone to the lengths that while I was in the hospital, he had one psychiatrist come see me and the psychiatrist had said, you know, I don't really think there's anything here that's psychiatric. And that was the, just the general psychiatrist who was on call. And so he then decided that he was going to have his buddy come in. And, you know, after, I think he had another psychiatrist come in and then finally he was going to have his buddy come in because he didn't believe the first two when they said that neither, neither of them thought there was any psychiatric problems and that it, that it wasn't, you know, um, psychosomatic. And I don't know if it's his ego. I, I don't know what it was, but, um, so then he had his buddy come in and, you know, try to, I think essentially he tried to have his buddy be like, oh yeah, it's definitely psychosomatic. And I was just like, I'm not seeing another person. Like we've been through this. And so unfortunately that was probably fuel to his fire of like, oh, well, if you're unwilling to see people, like if you're refusing to see a psychiatrist, even though I had already seen two, it, it, it was just a really bad match. But so then I was trying to figure out like, what is this guy's motives? Like he's here, he is saying I'm, I'm crazy and that I'm making all of this up for attention. And now he's telling me if my symptoms keep progressing, like, is he just trying to scare me out of this or is this real? And so I was desperate and I pulled all of my medical records and figured it out on my own. I was, I was sick of being treated the way I was being treated. And, you know, I was, I had worked for a doctor for multiple years. I understood how medical records work. I do know a lot of, I did know a lot of medical jargon. I obviously do not have an MD and I would never claim to have an MD, but I also have an education in science and knew how to research. And I think that was the biggest thing that helped lead me to finding the answer and finding a correct answer was having the, the education, the know-how and the ability to research. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is an excellent um, example of taking a negative situation and turning it into a positive um, that you were, you were in that position and you were able to do something with it. And it fueled you, like you said, to go get your medical records. And I imagine that there are lots of challenges for you 
in your career as an athlete that other people don't have because of your health issues. So I know that there have to be some really hard times, but I'm wondering, are there ways that those health issues have turned into a positive situation or that you have used them for positive? Absolutely. It was only about a year ago that I have been public with all of my, or with the complex chronic medical or illnesses, mainly because I had thought for so long, people would kind of look at me and be like, oh, like she can't be a competitive athlete. She has all of these other things going on. But the reality is, is it has made me the strongest person. The things I've dealt with my entire life, um, being told I can't, being told that this would never happen, that would never happen, that I can't do this, or you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't be an athlete who's on TPN. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. And I found a way. And so, you know, it's kind of for so many years hiding it, it taught me how to mask pain. And some of that came from being an athlete prior, you know, to all of this, but then it has kind of reinforced that. And so when I'm on the race course, I've had so many competitors say to me, we never know like how you feel because we cannot read you. Like, we don't know Mm -hmm. if you're dying. We don't know (laughs) if you're hurting or we don't know if you're just out for a Sunday stroll, like your face does not tell us anything. And, you know, I think, I think that's really real. Um, I've learned to push through the pain, learn to push past the pain. And as an athlete, I said last year when I was going through some other challenges or health stuff that pain during any workout or any race would never match what I've been through at other times in my life. And I remember that every time I'm racing that, and I, you know, I just am able to push myself so much further and so much harder because of it. I, my leg was amputated below the knee back in 2013 F because it is assumed that because the Chiari, uh, and that malformation and Basler invagination was left for so long, the pressure in both my brain and my spinal cord during that time started to cause damage to both the brain and spinal col- or spinal cord itself. Um, which left me with some long lasting neurological effects, one of which is spasticity and essentially my muscles. So although my joints are very loose, my muscles have gotten very tight because they don't get the correct neurological signal signals anymore. And it was a combination between the spasticity and the other Stanlow syndrome. The spasticity was so bad in, in my left foot that it was subluxing my ankle 24 hours a day, seven days a week at times, dislocating it. We tried bracing for years. We tried electrical stimulation. We tried literally every single thing we could think of. The spasticity would break the braces. The electrical stimulation worked for a little while, but eventually it started to cause deterioration in my knee, um, pain in my hip and my back. And I wasn't able to live the life that I wanted to live, which was being active, being able to take my dogs hiking, going, um, running with friends or, you know, any of the other active things I love to do. I was a competitive athlete and that part of me didn't change with my diagnoses. And so I had basically been told the only option left was surgical. I had met with about, I believe eight different surgeons. Almost everybody had a different opinion. Most of the opinions were their ideas of what they could do to try to save my leg. And, you know, these were not proven surgeries. These were like, well, we can try this and this and this. And if it doesn't work, then we'll just fuse your, your ankle or we'll just fuse your ankle and your knee or, and so I decided to start asking them what the success rate of these surgeries would be. You know, some of them involve multiple surgeries up to five or six, some of I mean, we're talking years of time. Some of them involved external fixators and all of these things. And I'm like, if I'm going to go through this, I want to know what the success rate is. And, and so when they start describing the success rate, I'm like, no, no, no. I don't want to know your success rate. This is how I'm basing. This is what I'm basing success off of. Am I going to be able to go hiking with my dogs? Am I going to be able to keep up with, you know, hopefully my future kids? Am I going to be able to enjoy an active lifestyle? And I made them look at success through that lens and tell me what success would be, because this was about my quality of life. This is my life. This isn't them, you know, doing some new surgery so that they can put it in a journal and use me as a lab rat. This was my life. And 
once they started looking at success through that lens, they were like, oh, I mean, maybe like 5% or like, you know, 3%. And, and you can find something else to do with your life. And I'm like, you're right. I definitely don't have to be a competitive athlete, but I'm always going to be active. Like you can't take that away. That is part of who I am. And not being that person would destroy me. And it was funny because the very first surgeon I had seen actually a year and a half prior to seeking surgical opinions had said, the best thing you can do is amputate. You'll have a better life, better quality of life. And I was just like, what? I mean, I just came here because my foot's a little messed up. Like, what are we talking about? And so I left his office and like never kind of looked back. And until a year and a half later, I was getting these surgical opinions and I remembered what he had said. I saw him again. Um, and I also, one other surgeon in these eight people that I saw, uh, said the same thing. Like we, we can try to save it. Like if, if this is about keeping your foot aesthetically, we can try to save it. We can do all of these things. Um, but if this is about living the life that you want to live, um, amputation is your best option. And so that is, uh, what we moved forward with. That's absolutely amazing. In my 25, 30 years of practicing medicine, you're the first person I've ever heard of or met or anything that had amputation for that reason. And we, we always worry about phantom limb pain. And so you already having EDS, you know, I would think that would also be a concern. And that's really fascinating that you approached it in the way that you did and said, this is what I need. And that they were able to figure out that that was the best option for you. And that you were able to then compete at the level that you've been able to compete at, given all of these amazing things that you've been through. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we were talking surgical options, elite athletics was off the table. It was not something that was considered in the decision I was making. And we knew surgery was necessary. My foot was losing circulation. It was getting sores on it and infections. So we knew no matter what surgery was going to have to happen. But I think for myself, I made the best decision possible. It had been three years that we had been trying everything we possibly could to get my foot back into its socket, to get circulation, to make sure that it was not going to cause damage to my knee and to my hip. And honestly, I have never second guessed the decision. I have never even, you know, the only time I ever think about it is when somebody's asking me about, about it on podcasts or for interviews or whatever it is, because you know, in four weeks I was walking and eight weeks I was running and had my life back after three years. Um, and, and to be fair, that is not normal. That is not a normal timeline. So if anybody hears that, that is right. experiencing amputation, please do not expect that. <laughs> right. I was like, right. I don't know, just like some freakishly hum- unhuman thing. I don't know what happened, but yeah. So let's not, let's not set expectations based off of that, please. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And, and you obviously are an incredibly strong-willed person, extremely motivated, have an incredibly positive attitude. I imagine that there's been some pretty hard days, both physically and emotionally. Can you share any tips for our audience or strategies on what you do in order to get through some of those hard days? Yeah. You know, I think there's a few things I use. The first being that the days that I'm just like not feeling it, uh, that you know, things are not going well. I have learned that for myself, my symptoms are typically better. If I am up and moving around, my blood pressure does better. If, you know, I'm not laying in bed for extended periods of time, I'm not sitting down a lot. And so I do try to get up, get active. And there's things that I've done long-term to control symptoms, but there are also things that I do in the moment. Some of the long thing, long-term things that I have found to be very, very helpful. And I absolutely understand. And know that this is not an easy journey, but one of the best things I did for myself. And one of the hardest things was to put on muscle mass, having, you know, problems getting nutrition. It was really hard for me to keep on weight, but being able to put on muscle mass has protected my joints. And then also specifically putting muscle mass on my my lower body has helped significantly with my symptoms of POTS. There is a caveat to this. It has to be kept up if I stop training, if I stop working out, which our bodies do need, our bodies do need rest. I lose weight very, very quickly. And my symptoms come back very, 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 very quickly. 
for example, after Tokyo this year, we rushed into Tokyo. Um, you had mentioned I had endocarditis. I had endocarditis in October of 2020. The games were in August of 2021. Um, the endocarditis turned into endocarditis itself is life threatening. Um, I had multiple reactions to medications and other things. Um, so it turned into a mess. Long story short, I was in the hospital from essentially October to the middle of February and was not back training until the middle of March. I had to qualify for the games in June and compete in August. So it was a very condensed timeline. So when we jumped in, we jumped in full force. There was no like build into exercise or anything like that. My body was in a state of stress constantly from this time we started work training to after me finishing competing. And so my body needed a break. I had to give my body a break. It needed it physiologically. I needed it mentally, all of that. So I for came back after Tokyo and I decided I was going to take some time off and only do what my body felt like doing, which was not much. It was walking the dogs. It was going hiking with friends. It was not swimming, running, biking, lifting, or any of the above. And I lost seven pounds. I lost muscle mass and all of my symptoms returned very quickly and very harshly ones that had been controlled. So our bodies do need rest, which is hard. Um, Mm -hmm. and it is hard to get back into it every time, but being active, adding that muscle mass definitely has made a huge difference in my symptoms. Um, the other thing that I do day to day is when I'm not feeling it, I don't want to get up. I tell myself I have to start whatever it is. And I'm, you know, for me, it happens to be a workout because that's what I do for most, you know, for work. If I wake up and I'm like, I just don't want to get out of bed. I'm not feeling good. I am dizzy. I'm whatever. I tell myself, you have to get up. You have to start. And if in 15 minutes after starting and you still feel like this, you can go back to bed and you can do whatever you want the rest of the day. Thing is, is usually within those 15 or 20 minutes, like your body's up and moving, your endorphins start going. And I'm like, oh. I actually don't feel as bad as I thought I did because getting up, getting my blood pressure up just makes me feel better. So that's one of the things I do. And even though I'm discussing a workout right now, I do it really with anything. You know, if I have calls in the morning or whatever it is, I will try to start it. And if I start feeling better, great. If not, I give myself some grace and my body, the rest that it needs. So I try really hard to listen to my body, but also Make sure my body's not lying to me, if that makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Or deceiving me, I guess would be a better, better word, because uh, sometimes it's hard to read what our bodies are telling us. What, what exactly does it need? Does it need rest or does it need some, does it need something else? Mm -hmm. There's two things from that, that I love is that number one, you can do more than you think you can, right? Well, more than two things. So I'm not going to number them. First, you can do more than you think you can. And I don't want everybody listening to think, well, I'm never going to win a gold medal. So she's just an amazing superhuman. Alyssa, you are an amazing superhuman, but you are also an example of how you, anybody can do more than they think they can sometimes, right? And giving yourself that just start, like just start it. And then we can make a decision further down. And if you need to, we'll show ourselves grace and we'll go back to bed. I think that's such an important point to make. And I love what you say about listen to your body, but also make sure your body's not deceiving you. (laughs) And it's hard to learn the difference in that, right? When you need to take that rest time, it's really important to listen to your body and take that rest. But sometimes your body is saying, just stay in bed when your body really means I need to move. I just don't want to. So those are all really great, really great tips. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think... For myself personally, I've always been the type of person that's just like push, 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 push. But, you know, I've talked to other people that are like more cautious than I am and are like, my body needs rest. It's telling me I need to rest. I rest, 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 rest. And although these are two opposite reactions, I think they're exactly the same. You know, it's us not understanding our bodies. And it has taken years to learn that pushing through everything is not going to accomplish what I want it to accomplish, but also doing nothing is not going to accomplish what I want to accomplish. And so we have to find the middle about the middle ground. We have to learn how to communicate with our bodies and we have to learn how and when it is appropriate to push through uncomfortableness and when to offer ourselves grace. 
Definitely. I think that's all so important. And another thing that I wanted to um, dive in just a little bit deeper, when you talked about muscle mass, I could not agree more when it comes to POTS symptoms. I, that's definitely something that I see in my patients as well. And I hear so often people say that I, that they have difficulty building muscle mass. And, and personally, as someone also that has EDS, I have tremendous difficulty um, putting on muscle mass. I would love to know how, what strategies you used that were successful for you to, to build more muscle. Yeah. So, um, when it comes to building muscle, I was, I was hesitant at first, mainly because I knew how hard it was for me to gain weight, right? Like my body likes this weight and it doesn't matter what I do. Like this is the weight my body is going to be. It is going to always tend to you know, to lose weight over gaining weight. Um, it's been like that ever since I was a child. And so when we had discussed adding muscle mass, um, and I discussed this with my athletic team, not with my medical team, I was hesitant because I was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. I, you know, getting in the calories, all of that. So I do work with both a clinical dietitian and a sport dietitian. They work in tandem. I do think anybody that does have, you know, gastroparesis or trouble putting on muscle mass, having a clinical dietitian is helpful. I have a sport dietitian as well because they just specialize in sport itself, right? So she, the sport dietitian's job is to make sure that I'm fueling my body appropriately for sport. The clinical dietitian is like, okay, this is, this is the recommendations of what you need from the sport dietitian. So how do we get that? If I was not an elite athlete, I would need, I would not need a sport dietitian. And in a very long winded way, all I'm trying to say is that a dietitian is helpful in this process and a clinical dietitian would be perfectly capable of helping you put on muscle mass. So that is the first thing is if we don't have an excess of calories, then it is not possible to gain mass. That is just how the body works. If there's no building blocks, there is no building. And so that is part one. Part two is with the instability in my joints with hyperextension with all of my subluxations and things like that. We started at the ground level. Please do not just like go pick up a 30 pound weight and expect to like achieve something here. All you're going to achieve is injury. And when I said we started at the ground level, like we started with no weights at all. We started with just body movements, learning how to move my body in a safe and healthy way, learning proper range of motion. Those are things that you have to accomplish first. If you do not have that, you're just going to cause an injury. And this is not, this is not just for people with the EDS. This is literally for everybody. Like the strength and conditioning sure. coach I work with, he does this with every single athlete he works with because the main purpose of strength training is not necessarily getting stronger. It is keeping your joints and your body healthy. So if you don't know healthy ranges of motion, how are you going to keep your body healthy? So that is step one. There are a lot of resources. If you don't have access to a team, I do understand I have access to more people given my career choice. Um, but if you don't have access to a team, there are a lot of resources online, videos and things like that. Just make sure that the ones, the resources you're looking at are coming from reputable sources and are not just some fitness bro, like shooing out anything he can for views and likes. Um, that is the best advice I can offer, but there are good resources online. And I'm actually currently working on a YouTube series to hopefully help people that don't have the resources I do with some of the things I've learned. The next step is adding in very lightweight that can be done with resistance bands. Um, you can get a set of resistance bands off of Amazon or eBay or wherever you choose to shop for about $30. And that will take you a very long way. So you don't need to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to make this happen. And with the resistance band, you start with the lightest one and you continue working on those same motions, um, not extending past a healthy range of range of motion, making sure that you're engaging the correct muscles and, you know, trying to stay balanced on each side. Everybody has one weaker side, but we need to try our best to stay balanced. And from there, we can start adding weight. And so when people see, you know, me posting videos on social media or this or that with weight, that took years to achieve. That did not happen overnight. That did not happen in a month. That did like that literally happened in over years. Um, and so that's kind of step two to, two to this whole process. The good thing is they can be done at the same time while you're working on your nutrition and making sure you're getting enough 
calories and protein and all of that, you can be starting the range of motion and the band work and all of that as well. So it's definitely a concurrent process, concurrent process that can be happening at the same time. And, and this just comes back to the one of the themes that is coming out of this conversation, which is that it's a long process, right? The diagnosis might be a long process. The training should be a long process. So for you, it was a condensed process to get to the Tokyo Games. Uh, building muscle mass is a long process. Figuring out the balance that your, need, that your body needs is a long process. There's just, there's a lot to that. One of the things I have wondered about for you that is that since you are an elite athlete and you travel the world, as a person with multiple medical conditions, how do you prepare for international travel and making sure that you are going to have the support that you need? I know that travel is a big issue for even our high-level athletes that we work with to make sure they have some sort of medical stability, some sort of team in place or the ability to get the care that they need. So how do you make that happen? I like to call it organized chaos <laughs> and sometimes a little more guts than I probably should have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it is hard. It is really hard. Um, I, when I travel, I ha- travel with a lot. Um, I have my nutrition. I have um, my medications. I have everything that normal people don't have. Um, I can't just walk into a new uh, restaurant to get my nutrition. I have to bring it with me. And that is not easy, Um, especially not easy when you're traveling across the world or when you are traveling somewhere where you have to be for multiple weeks and your medications expire or this happens or that you've got customs to deal with and everything. You have to educate yourself. You have to be prepared. Every time I travel somewhere, I make sure that I have researched what the local or if there's a local English speaking hospital, if not seeing what translation services are in the country, not everybody has the same laws as the U S that is something you have to realize. ADA is the Americans with disability act. It is not valid anywhere else in the world. So you need to know where you're going. You need to know their customs, there's their laws and their rules, um, to be the most prepared. So everywhere I go, I do I do my research. I, if there's an English speaking hospital, I have all of its contact information just in case I need it. I, um, if there's not an English speaking hospital, I know how translation services work. Do I need to hire a translator? Does the hospital provide a translator? Is there somebody, you know, within the race that I'm going to, that would be able to translate? Do they have medical services? All of those things. And I just try to be as prepared as possible. Things happen. I've only ended up in a hospital in a foreign country once, which I think is a very good record, but I just try to be as prepared as possible. I, you know, and to just make sure you are advocating in a way that is appropriate based on the customs and the traditions of the place you are traveling to. They, like I said, you know, ADA is just American. I think that is one thing that makes me cringe when people are like, but they're not following the laws. I'm like, well, it's not their law. They don't have to follow it. Places don't have to be accessible. They don't have to offer translators. They don't like, and a lot of countries don't. And so you have to be prepared to provide your own services, but also advocate in a way that is effective because sometimes the way we advocate in America is not going to be effective in other countries. You're going to be seen as rude, um, hostile, or combative. So you need to know these things. Those are all very important things when you're traveling. Wow. Yeah, de- definitely. And and speaking of advocating for yourself, we know that there's a whole spectrum of hypermobility and associated disorders and the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are actually a group of 14 different uh, subtypes. And then there's hypermobility spectrum disorder and, you know, all these different uh, types of conditions for these people who are listening and are wondering about maybe it's the advocating or any of the other aspects that we've talked about. Is there anything in particular that you would like someone to know that has hypermobility spectrum disorder or one of the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes? I think the biggest thing I think there's a few things. I think the first is a diagnosis is not an end all be all. If you're not getting a diagnosis, it's not the end of the world. I know some people can get very hung up and sometimes, yes, it does help mentally to know like, okay, this is what is wrong, but you can take steps to try to improve your quality of life, even without a diagnosis. 
believe me, most everything I've done to improve my quality of life has not come from a doctor. Actually, almost everything has not come from a doctor. A lot of it is lifestyle choices that I've made personally. Like I had mentioned, it's putting on muscle mass. It's finding the right balance between being active and giving myself grace. It's learning how to communicate with my body. It's all of those things. So if you're in the process and you just feel like of trying to get a diagnosis and you just feel like you're not being heard, take a step back and ask yourself, is what I'm putting myself through going, like, is this having a diagnosis? Is it worth what I'm going through currently for my mental health just to have this label? Or if it's not, maybe I can take a step back and start doing some of these lifestyle changes on my own. Maybe I can start learning, you know, appropriate ranges of motion. Maybe I can start learning what, what my body wants from me and how, you know, how best to serve my body to get the best out of my quality of life. Because dude, at the end of the day, a label is not worth the turmoil. And I was in a position that I needed life-saving medical treatment. I just see people so frustrated because people aren't listening to them. And I'm like, it might feel better for five minutes to have that diagnosis, but is it worth what you're going through right now? If it's a decision we all have to make individually, right? Maybe it's worth stepping back and trying to make these lifestyle changes, giving yourself a break and showing yourself some grace. I think that's all it is because it is hard. Um, being gaslit by physicians is hard. Being not, not being believed is hard. Not all of those things. And, and let me tell you, the diagnosis doesn't, doesn't necessarily change that either. You're still going to be gaslit by physicians. You're still going to find physicians who don't believe you or don't believe in EDS or anything else. That is all still there. So that's my first piece of advice. The second is that there are our options to make our quality of lives better. I just really hope nobody finds themselves in a pattern of self-despair or destruction because you can live an amazing life. And I don't want this to come from like, oh, well, you're a gold medal athlete standing on top of the world because I've been in your shoes. And the reality is we all have our gold medal goals, right? And that might be like, being able to take your kids to the park. And if that is your goal, that is an amazing goal. It is a worthy goal. It is a good goal to focus on. So don't take other people's level of perceived success as what you can or cannot do. Every single one of us has different goals, different aspirations and different lives. And some things mean more to others than they would to ourselves. And so there are ways to achieve what you want to. You have to have hope. You have to be willing to be uncomfortable at times because it is only through being uncomfortable that we do make these gains. Um, And that's hard. And some people are better at being uncomfortable than others, but all of us can do it. We all have that power too. We just have to find the strength. And usually is that that is through focusing on a goal or focusing on something that we want to achieve. And if you are finding yourself in like despair or this pattern of self-destruction or not wanting to do anything, feeling hopeless, please find somebody to talk to. Please find help. Please find a counselor. It is worth it. Feeling better, being able to enjoy life, that quality of life, like I mentioned earlier, is the most important aspect. And if it's helpful, take some of the steps that I've done for myself. Take to your doctor, like, this is what I consider success. How do we reach it? Don't let them define success for you. Define it for yourself um, and be confident in how you want to define it. Wow. Okay. I feel like that was just an amazing 20 minute inspirational TED talk in about two minutes of conversation. (laughs) So thank you for coming to my TED talk. (laughs) (laughs) That was really great because it feels like I can tell that everything that you are saying is coming from a very real place of hard won information, right? This is not something that you read in a motivational book. This is something that you have learned the hard way through walking this really long road, oftentimes in a very lonely way. And I think that that comes through very clearly that this is um, hard won experience speaking. And it is amazing to me how positive you are and how so many points in your life you have moved with the assumption of, well, I'm an athlete. So And moving forward with that, rather than going, am I ever going to be able to walk again? You said, I'm going to walk again. What's the best way to do that? What is the best way for me to move forward with the lifestyle that I want? And how can I make that happen? And I'm sure that there have been compromises and I'm sure there have been lots of disappointments, but you are an amazing example of um, what can happen if you move forward with a heart that is 
so very, very dedicated <laughs> to finding the answers and giving yourself the life that, that you want. How can other people find you and find out more about you? What is yeah. a good way for them to reach you? The best way really to find me is on social media, which I think is everything for, you know, is like most of the world nowadays. I am not great at social media, but I'm trying my best. I'm, you know, one of my biggest challenges is I tend to not like putting myself out there in big ways, but I am trying to do better because I do know how many people are struggling with things that I have struggled with. And hopefully by sharing my story, maybe a doctor will see like, oh, this is incredible. Like maybe I should have my patients define what success is for them. Maybe I should stop defining it for them. Um, or, you know, a patient seeing like, you know, seeing like, Oh, look, like if this is how she got through this, maybe I can give that a try or whatever it is. So I'm trying my best, but check out social media on Instagram, um, on all of my handles. I am try Alyssa T R I A L L Y S A and hopefully get in touch. I'm always happy to share advice. It may take me a little bit of time to get back to you given where I am in the world and things like that. But I do try to um, communicate with as many people as I can and answer as many questions as I can. And I would love to hear from you. That's amazing and incredibly gracious of you. Well, you have been listening to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. Today, we have been speaking with Alyssa Seeley, two-time paratriathlon gold medalist, Fresh off her gold medal win in Tokyo. Alyssa, we thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Bendy Bodies podcast and share your expertise with us today. It has been really wonderful to hear your story and learn from you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great chatting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD, where we explore the intersection of health and hypermobility for dancers and other aesthetic athletes. If you found this information valuable, please share it with a colleague or friend and leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. Remember to subscribe so you won't miss future episodes. If you want to follow us on Instagram, it's at bendy underscore bodies and our website is www.bendybodies.org. If you want to follow Bendy Bodies founder and co-host Dr. Bluestein on Instagram, it's at hypermobilitymd, all one word, and her website is www.hypermobilitymd.com. If you want to follow co-host Jennifer Milner on Instagram, it's at Jennifer period Milner, M-I-L-N-E-R. And her website is www.jennifer-milner.com. Thank you for helping us spread the word about hypermobility and associated conditions. We want to hear from you. Please email us at info at bendybodies.org to share feedback. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely of the co-host and their guests. They do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of any organization. The thoughts and opinions do not constitute medical advice and should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. This information is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease as this information is for quali- educational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please refer to your local qualified health practitioner for all medical concerns. We'll catch you next time on the Bendy Bodies Podcast.